Hello, uh, I'm Harry, your host at uh, Episteme Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to scientists, entrepreneurs, and deep tech startups. Deep tech startups are particular companies, young, innovative companies that will change our lives. Today, it's my pleasure and honor to receive Dr. Pranjul, Pranjul Shah. He is an uh, engineer in electronics and electric, electrical um, uh, engineering, and he holds a PhD in microfluidics. Uh, Dr. Shah is also a deep tech serial entrepreneur. Uh, he is also right now the head of the incubator at the University of uh, Luxembourg. So, how are you today, Dr. Shah? I'm doing very well, and uh, thanks a lot for this invitation. Uh, I'm pleasure to be here and, uh, and talking to you about our activities. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's our pleasure to have you because uh, what you do at the University of Luxembourg is, is really awesome, and we would, we would want to hear about. And I think it will inspire not only entrepreneurs, uh, but also uh, uh, incubator around in, in all over the world, because what you do is very, very uh, interesting. Um, so could you please uh, present yourself and your path uh, in, in the STEM? Why did you study STEM and why, <laughs> why did you uh, follow the path you have uh, followed? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I originally come from India um, and uh, like, like a lot of people in India, of course, IT was my first uh, choice of uh, path. Uh, but in 2002, when the Y2K you know, bust didn't happen, the, there was a huge amount of, let's say, uh, over, over, over uh, supply of, uh, of IT engineers worldwide. And there was a huge slump in the IT, in the IT industry until 2006, uh, seven when the mobile a revolution started. So in the midst of all of that, I was really thinking uh, if in 2002, two years from finishing my uh, bachelor's course in computer engineering, I was thinking, do I want to join the IT revolution or I want to do something different? And I've always believed in the power of mentors and advisors, and they have played a huge role in where I am today and continue to play that role. So I, I actually went and, uh, you know, picked the brain of one of my mentors at that time, uh, of about what, what does he suggest I should do in terms of you know the next steps in my career and uh, and a very wise advice at that time that I got was why don't you look into the field of micro and nanotechnologies um, it's something which is not there yet but it's something which is really touted to be the future and I really uh, got inspired by by the what I heard like in the initial five minute kind of introduction that I got I spent the next two two months getting as deep as I could in the field and that really inspired me and I could I could see clearly that this was where the world was moving we were talking about in 2009 where we were already thinking about uh, chips uh, you know implanted into into different organs and uh, we were talking about uh, chips doing biology and you know so we were looking at sequencing and you know so some of the introductions that I got um, of technologies which could come out in 2002 is something what I now already see have become reality. So that was so I mean, mind-boggling but inspiring and that kind of pushed me to move away from uh, IT and then jump a little bit more towards futuristic technologies or uh, fields like micro and nanotechnology. So in my master's, well, my, my, the title of my master's in electronics and electrical engineering, my entire focus in there uh, in, in the studies was towards learning as much skills about micro and nanotechnologies as I can. Uh, specifically, I was very interested about plastic electronics. So I think the, the world is, at the moment, everybody who's going to now buy their next TV are going to buy a piece of plastic electronics because the future TVs of OLEDs, the ultra-thin OLEDs, are, are using not metals, but the, the all the transistors or the... Uh, or the photochromes, everything have been moved, the LEDs have been moved to organic LEDs, which is basically uh, putting them on a plastic sheet. And that is why they can make it make them so thin. But I, I did that uh, as, a, as a master's project in, in 2003. So that's how ahead the field was already then. And the thought process was uh, so uh, long ago. So this was just uh, a detour that initiated me and put me somehow on a path to where I am because already then I realized that uh, if you could be in a field where you could innovate and and design technologies which are not even there yet, most people have not even imagined them yet, but you have a role to play, you could very quickly have a, first of all, it's fun, 
because you are shaping the future with your own hands. But at the same time, it has so much potential entrepreneurial wise, but also for, for a career. It's so much meaningful um, to be ahead of the curve and, and you can create a lot of value for the society economically, but also socially. And um, with that master's, I, I was sure that of course, um, I want to apply this knowledge in new field. And one of the fields that was very exciting for me, and this is what I'd read, uh, what had also inspired me to get into this sector of micro nanotechnology was the applications of micro nanotechnology in biology. So my, in my PhD, I started looking at how can we apply microfluidics and micro nanotechnologies for, for genetic analysis. So how can we detect um, babies uh, before even they are born as early as possible um, that if they may have some genetic disorders. So this is a huge uh, challenge right now. Um, continues to be a challenge because still the technologies that I invented during my PhD, um, some of them are not yet commercialized because it takes a while to, before the technologies sure. become commercially available. But we could reduce some of the time uh, that are currently needed for diagnosis, uh, doing prenatal diagnosis by a third of what uh, the current practices are. And, uh, and th this, was, uh, this was fascinating to see and you could see the impact because uh, I personally had the, to go through this uh, strenuous time of uh, not getting results for, for six weeks of does uh, your child potentially have something or not. And, and that just uh, was so, so meaningful to see that you could make a difference to a very pressing problem. Um, I have always been, as I said, uh, excited about technology. So during my PhD, Apart from just in, uh, finishing my PhD, I was uh, responsible for inventing six or seven different technologies. So I had a lot of patents, more patents and publications. And uh, one of them led me to a path of creating a company with a few of, our, few of my friends and, and colleagues. And we actually wanted to, in 2009, create what eventually, the technology which eventually was what Theranos uh, in, it, wanted to come out with. Uh, so we were really looking at doing blood diagnostics on a point of care technology. Uh, we had some good success. We raised some early rounds of funding. Unfortunately, 2009-10, everything crashed and uh, we decided to basically um, liquidate the assets that we have and then um, basically find ways to still monetize. Uh, me, I, I, I interrupt you because it's very interesting what you're saying because usually when we think about the crisis of 2008-2009, the subprime and then the, the Lehman Brothers, you know, uh, world collapse, that induced the world collapse, usually people think about big banks and interior and, and you know, the, the, the local economy, uh, real estate, but you don't think about startup. Startup also yes. has, has been deeply impacted. I think, I think because, uh, I mean, if, if you think about money, money flows from big organizations down to small organizations in multiple different ways. So the biggest funding for, for deep tech startups comes from venture capitalists. Absolutely. Now venture capitalists are dependent on LPs and LPs are dependent on their companies doing well. So if globally the stocks have gone down everywhere, the market is down, there's no clear indication of how long this crisis will, will remain. Everybody becomes conservative. So, I mean, that, 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 that is not the time when people are in, investing in high risk, high reward technologies. People are making more, you know, low risk and high reward bets or low risk and low reward bets, but still not, uh, definitely not high risk, high reward bets. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of interest, a lot of VCs we were talking to, a lot of um, companies, corporate ventures were in, interested and excited about the technology, but they all asked us to hold on for six months uh, and we will come back to you when the crisis is better. Please, we are really interested. But at the moment, the, the clear indication from the board is to not invest anymore. So this, this reminds me exactly what happened yet, uh, last year at the same time during the COVID crisis. Uh, no, all the VC were completely freed and yes. told to, to entrepreneurs, okay, it's very interesting, but let's come back later. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And this is, this, is, this is natural because what most VCs decided to do is, is uh, they said, we are not going to make any new investments. We are actually going to put in money again in already existing companies so that they don't fail. Yeah. So they were, in fact, they put more money. If you look at the number of deals, there were in fact more investments made in terms of value of investments mm -hmm. than, uh, than before crisis. But most of them were scale up funding in already existing companies Absolutely. to make sure that they could go through the crisis. And this is, this is very similar to what happened also in 2009-10 that 
the funding dried up and a lot of innovative projects uh, unfortunately did not take off which which could have uh, been a game changer but uh, what what was exciting for us is that we still managed to to bring the technology to um, to a worthy uh, you know pass it on uh, to to a worthy you know successor who continues to exploit it in different way in a clean tech space so the technology still lives but not in life sciences but in a clean tech uh, you know area so that's that's exciting to see uh, also uh, what for me as uh, as a career perspective was very rewarding because the danish government uh, offered me a kaufman uh, scholar fellowship so i could go to mit stanford harvard for 6 months and learn the ropes of entrepreneurship i was sitting in you know in mit classrooms learning about um, how to do, do turnarounds uh, i was sitting in um in howard and learning about how to do negotiations i was sitting in stanford and learning about you know raising funds i was meeting investors at stanford uh, startup fair and i was being, i was flying around the country uh, visiting some of the most innovative companies uh, some of them even in the earliest days of their life cycle and uh, i mean we we visited you know twitter when they were like uh, 10 people uh, <laughs> and uh, i think we, we probably might have even visited uh, um what's up at that time because we were like walking around plug and play tech accelerator at that time uh, and i remember they were we had kind of overlap uh, with with the time that what's up was there and so we met a lot of these very very exciting companies at very early days when they were like in this cubicle spaces in in plug and play tech accelerator in, in the silicon valley we visited a lot of different companies and it was just so easy uh, the way american entrepreneurial ecosystem works it's Uh, the whole idea of uh, paying it forward uh, like pay it forward don't expect something if if a good will something good will happen or come out of it you will eventually be rewarded is something europe needs to really you know adapt and but at the incubator and this is this is if i have to say in one line what we really try to do at at the incubator at the university of luxembourg is re- we are really paying it forward we are really making it possible for our startups and entrepreneurs to to take care of um, you know we take care of everything for them so that the, the absolute uh, i mean focus for them is on success and we take care of all roadblocks that can be for them um but you know yeah so after denmark i moved to luxembourg i've been here now 10 years i was the first employee on the new city designs that luxembourg has created in the south of the country i actually moved here before the university moved here because they came one month after me so when i came here i was the only one with two of two other people who started on the same day uh in in a big building uh, where the rest of the universities eventually moved so i've practically seen the foundations of every building on the campus being built uh i've lived through their uh, shocks because uh, it was a lot of hammering yeah. going down <laughs> and what is belval now i mean in 10 years ago i can tell you it was there was nothing i mean there was one or two restaurants uh, available uh, for food there was no canteens or, uh, it was it was something very different and to see now what it has become in last 10 years it's also you know a lot of testament to the to the will of the luxembourgish government to really become a knowledge uh, driven uh, economy like really not rely in his, what is typically what's working for them right now it's the financial industry and the steel industry but they're re- really looking towards the future is that if we if we will harness knowledge uh, we will we will cre- come out with future you know future of the economy and we will have uh, ample waves of new tech and new technologies to to ride upon to continue to be you know economically you know leaders in in, in europe so uh now um so you 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 lead this incubator at the university uh as i, as I said uh, previously uh, all the entrepreneurs i interviewed previously uh, they are all very grateful for what you what you do uh, for them uh, I, i mean uh, all the program including the entrepreneurship program and the incubator also uh they are and in fact uh, it, it's, it's very amazing what you do and uh, could you please uh, explain us exactly your secret sauce uh, because you know the startup when you come uh, whatever if you are phd or before or master you have an idea you don't have you know the business mindset etc so yes. uh, you have the mindset the skill set but also any startup has the three dimension you know the desirability uh, yes. the feasibility of the project and the viability the economic 
the economy. Yes. Uh, how do you uh, bring all together to help them to, to make uh, to make uh, to transform the idea into reality? So, so one of the one of the things that we very very quickly realized uh, when we were starting to identify the gap in the ecosystem in Luxembourg, uh, it was it was a process that took us about two years. We started out five years ago to give to start putting the the sketch of what this entrepreneurship uh, you know center or initiative or program and incubator will look like. And to do that, we started first talking to everybody in the in the ecosystem because um, just like they say, it takes a it takes a village to raise a child. It's it's very much the same. You need a whole ecosystem for any startup to succeed. No startup in the world can can have become no successful company like any Fortune 500 company. If you really trace back its roots, you will find that they they were immensely helped by the ecosystem. Absolutely. There were so many other people who play a role there. And we realized very quickly that at the university as well, we had so many promising ideas, so much uh, uh, hidden hidden talent, but also know-how and intellectual uh, prowess uh, hidden within the university's research labs, which was uh, which was currently not being utilized for or not being exploited enough for the for 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 unlocking the value that's basically what's trapped within. And then we looked at the reasons behind it and we started talking to researchers and I said, why don't you think of starting a company? What is it? What is lacking? What we realized that the first thing was, was a huge skills gap, right? When people don't have the skills to do something, uh, they find it difficult. You naturally convince yourself that it's impossible. It's a, it's a, it's an easy way for us to, to, you know, avoid something which you don't, you don't, are not familiar with. Um, and this is what has happened with Luxembourg. If you look, up, if you think about it, if you look at the ecosystem in Luxembourg, most of the companies are actually created by external people who come here. They're already probably semi-successful or already very successful elsewhere. They come to Luxembourg, use it as a base to grow in the European market, and then maybe eventually even worldwide. Uh, they leverage the good uh, economy, the strong government policies for their growth. But as, as, a, as a country, Luxembourg was not really known for creating homegrown companies. So when we talk, talk to students, we realize there's a huge mindset gap. And part of that was fueled, as I said, because of the skills gap. Uh, I mean, it's, you have to be almost mad, or you have to be crazy in a country where jobs are so secure, high, well, high paid, the standard of living is so amazing, to think of doing anything other than landing a job and to take any risks. What we were telling, we were telling students, and we identified uh, this particular niche of students that you have potential. Secondly, what what we realized that there were, in, were there were very interesting similarities between local students and intellect international students. So, University of Luxembourg happens to be one of the most international universities in the world. It was the number one in 2018. Now it's in the top three still. So with 6,000 students, we still have about 120 nationalities represented. Now, most of the students, they come to Luxembourg. They're coming from countries where most likely the standard of living cannot match what Luxembourg has to offer. The life, the quality of life, the, the, the systems in terms of, you know, medical, healthcare, education systems is, is something that's unmatched. So most, it's, it's very likely that these people want to stay here. But it does not mean that they're all going to get jobs so easily. So we told them, look. You are in the land of possibilities. I mean, U.S. ecosystems were built by immigrants, right? I mean, if, if, if you look at Fortune 500 companies, most CEOs are not uh, American. They came from different parts of the world and they, they brought with them great ideas, great knowledge. But most importantly, they came with resilience. They, for them, it was important to, to stay because they wanted to uh, you know, upgrade their quality of life and live in this new land, the promised land. And I think Luxembourg is, uh, has the potential to become this new promised land, and especially for our students who come here and, uh, and they, they, they fall in love with this country. They even find their you know, partners here. They find, make friends here. They, they have their first jobs here. And, and not everyone is going to be happy with the kind of jobs they're on offer because not every sector that university teaches courses in are prominent in the job market. So we told them like, look, there are gaps in the, in the job market for, for what you want to do, but that does not mean that there is any restriction for you. If you want to do something, we are here for you. So we create start- Create your own jobs. <laughs> yes, exactly. You create your own jobs. 
Secondly, what we started telling them the, uh, and systematically, you know, you can call it even brainwashing, telling students that, you know, right from the day uh, at open day, when the students come to the university or uh, to consider the University of Luxembourg as their, you know, next step in their uh, or, or one stop between their destination to their careers, we tell them like, look, we are an entrepreneurial university. Not only we teach entrepreneurship, but we provide you all necessary facilities that you can actually do it while you are a student. So that already takes away the risk involved in, in saying no to a high paid job because at this time you're anyways not going to do a job. You're still studying. Why don't you just start a company while you are studying? You will learn so much out of it. If you are successful by the time you finish your course, you'll never take a job. You'll just move straight to a company. If you're not, well, you shut shop, you get the best job you will have a lot more knowledge, know-how, experience than any of your classmates and peers who will just have the degree in hand. You're going to say, look, I, I did this, but the best part was really that I tried to create a company. I was innovative. I, I was thinking out of the box. I was engaging with customers. I was managing my own project. I already have managerial uh, skills. I have leadership skills, uh, entrepreneurial skills. And these are much more in demand now than the skills that your degree teaches you. So you will be in fact even much better place to even land your dream job if you do this so that slowly started resonating with students not everybody has to be an entrepreneur sure. we don't even want that but at least if you want to be a leader and have a good uh, high uh, let's say rapidly advancing career you need to have certain skills beyond your core skills uh, we, we, we we routinely see students who leave university maybe they have done it but in two years time, uh, they become project managers. Now, as an IT project manager, you don't do IT, you do management. And those skills are not taught in, uh, to IT students. Absolutely. So we, we told them like, look, uh, no matter which position you will be in as an entrepreneur, as a manager, you are going to need skills which university cannot teach you uh, in the traditional structure, but we can. We can give you opportunity not only like to attend courses, but also if you want to put in practice some of those skills, we are going to make it possible for you with no risk. So in Luxembourg now, and there the government helped us also because four years back, they opened this one, one, one company possibility. So with one euro, one form and one uh, day of your time investment, you can create a company. We said, look, uh, uh, we let's add one more one to that and we'll give students uh, rent free. It's one euro per month rent, uh, an office desk which we can, they can use and, and like really start becoming professional and, you know, call it their office and let's see what happens. Could, could you please remind, uh, re, re uh, the one, uh, one euro. One euro. One so month. Luxembourg, uh, one euro, one form. One form. And one day of work. Yes. That's There's the three one, one, one. So Luxembourg has this Sal, Sal S. They have uh, this is the SAL simplified in Luxembourg. It takes you one form, one day, and one euro to register your company. Okay. Uh, and we said, look, we were going to add a, a corresponding one more one for you. And especially for it's only available, of course, to we are an incubator only for the university, right? We don't take companies from outside if, to to be affiliated to the incubator, to be hosted by uh, the incubator. You need to be either a student or a staff member from the university uh, ecosystem. You could be an alumni, but there too, we have put a sharp cutoff. It needs to be less than two years. After that, uh, I mean, if you open it up, then the whole of Luxembourg could be potentially you know, incubated. <laughs> so we said, look, we're going to do a cutoff here at two years, and then you can still come back. Our mentoring program, though, where we mentor students, is open to all, all university graduates. Ten years after you have left university, suddenly you decide, I want to be entrepreneurial. You can come back and get mentored by us. It's a, it's a free mentoring service because there we, we believe that we can still bring value and there we are not somehow doing a disservice to other players in the ecosystem. And because, I mean, a startup, as I said, is, I mean, they could be at the same time in five different mentoring programs. There's no, no risk involved, but we will not host them. And after five years of corporate experience, if you're creating a company, you should have resources and, you know, budgets available to, to, you know, be hosted at any other incubator in the ecosystem. But for young students who are just at the start of their career, we want to make it happen. We want to support them. We want to hand hold them a little bit more. So we are basically becoming a, what we like to say as a pre-incubator before they really start to face the music of the, 
of the of of the market. So as soon as they are more than uh, twelve people in the team, we kick them out. If they raise funds, if they land a, a check of one million euro, then we kick them out. Um, so it, there's also sharp cutoffs after which they have to move out. Is because uh, the idea is that we have limited resources at the university. As much as we want them to succeed, we have also a huge pipeline. Uh, and as you already know, we we started out three years back. Uh, at that time, the university claimed about five startups that have come out of the university. Now, in three years, uh, you know, 2021, we have uh, more than 37 companies that we are mentoring. There are 21 uh, registered companies already at the incubator. Uh, we have supported now more than 130 different ideas um, from idea sh- stage all the way to the mentoring. And soon now we are launching an acceleration program where, where essentially I'm, I'm giving the same experience that I received uh, from, from the ex- immersion in the U.S. ecosystem to, to future entrepreneurs. So it actually is, is fully giving back the, the knowledge, the know-how, but also the experience. So we will take uh, seven of of our top startups for one month to US on a fundraising trip. So they are going to meet uh, between 20 to 30 investors, top investors, all curated personally for them. So if there are seven startups, it's not that they're all gonna meet the same investors. They'll all meet different uh, investors curated for them. We'll already have done introductions. We'll already have a plan for them. So essentially they'll be pitching like, you know, to one investor per day. Um, sometimes even more. Sometimes it could be the angel group. So it's it's 20 investors in a room. But the goal is that they should learn how to face the music of investors. It's it's really different how you raise funds in Luxembourg, in Europe, and how you raise funds in the US. Now, we understand that not, for not all the startups, US might be the, the right place. Uh, there might be some might have to look nearby. But we want to give them the best of the experience and uh, driven by excellence as, as uh, and the quality as the criteria. We will also take them to Israel for a few weeks and do the same exercise. Um, what, what it will teach them, uh, and I hope that it will teach them, is first of all that raising funds in different ecosystems is done in a very, very different way. Not just valuation. It's not just, uh, you know, that in the in US you probably can claim 10x more valuation than what you can claim in Europe and it will still fly if you have the fundamentals in place. But it's also about how investors look at the company, how they do due diligence, how they put focus on different parts of the company, uh, team, idea, customers, your plan, your ambition, uh, different things play different roles in different ecosystems and the weightage for how investor decides to invest sometimes can be very different. So we want to give them this world-class exposure and prepare them. Uh, Maybe it's not gonna be for this company that they manage to raise funds, but they will come back very clear of where they need to be if they want to ever raise funds. And, and we believe that if not with their current company, next time they do the job, they're going to do it right. We hope that already this time, it's not too late and most of these companies can learn from this immersion, uh, get the knowledge, know-how, pivot where needed, if, if needed, pivot timely, gain the customers, gain investors' trust, build these relationships, Um, start meeting the milestones in line with what investor would like to see. And hopefully uh, within the next six months to one year, we'll have some good successful investment rounds that our startups will raise and also use Luxembourg as a launch pad and and make uh, make a path for themselves in the global arena. Uh, If you continue to talk about this fundraising uh, process, uh, when you created the incubator, uh, and you, you challenge it, you know, the, the Business Angels uh, Club in Luxembourg, or even the, the, the VC, uh, as you were very uh, pioneer, you know, in what you are you were doing at the time. Uh, how was the, the, the reaction? Was these guys uh, receptive to what you were, it was your, you were hoping at that time, or, or they were saying, no, we are, we, are, we are not a land of staff, uh, we prefer to look at elsewhere? Or, I, I think I think Luxembourg has changed a lot uh, since 2000. And, um, so when I, when I came to Luxembourg in the first three years itself, I invented a new technology here. And I started to create a company around it. We started going around knocking doors for raising seed fund. And, um, and we also were not just raising seed fund. We were also asking the government, why don't we have a seed fund around the university? 
Um, and the part of the, the activities that I do at the incubator is, is basically the gap that I felt myself that exists. And I'm trying to fill that gap so that future entrepreneurs don't have the same challenges. So one of the reasons why we were given very early on on why Luxembourg doesn't need a seed fund is that, it's, that there's just no deal flow. And most companies, if you even currently see um, that they're coming to Luxembourg and all the rounds that you hear about that Luxembourg companies are raising, most of them are currently still, or many of them are currently still being subsidized by the government. So there are some investors pooling together, but there are also some uh, government, you know, in co-financing or investment rounds that go in there. And I do agree partly. I mean, because if you look at the companies, they're very, the, the deal flow is nothing compared to bigger ecosystems in, in Europe. And it, it needs to be, it's a problem that needs to be fixed. And that is why we created the incubator that now we can say that, well, we have uh, at least 60 homegrown, completely homegrown organic <laughs> companies uh, that have come out of here. And we just hope that this will continue to, to amplify going forward uh, because the message is slowly starting to trickle down to, to bachelor students, to master students, to PhDs. And if anything, I think COVID has only helped us there. So I think there is still a skepticism in the government. The will is there. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you can see the government's directions, the trajectory that they have uh, taken. The, the political will is there. They are investing, um, but still there's a lot to be done. You don't build an ecosystem in a day. It takes about, sure. it takes a decade. Um, I, I see if COVID not, had not come in five years time, my target for 2025 was that Luxembourg will be among a, among a hot, very hot ecosystem in, the, in Europe. I see maybe it will be delayed by a couple of years, but I, I, by, I mean, by 2030, I don't see that you will have um, any lack of quality of startups and, and funding that they will cater or, or seek and successfully seek and that they will grow out of Luxembourg. This is gonna happen. And the government will also continue to play a big role there. Um, it's just no brainer. I mean, uh, if you start seeing um, that startups from university are going to US and Israel and raising big rounds, but they are not able to do it here. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's also a message that the government takes that, uh, okay, maybe we have to do something to retain these companies here. And uh, because yes, I mean, some companies we might lose, I mean, at least they will have ties with the university because a lot of them use the IP from the university. But uh, I mean, we want to see them succeed wherever they are because uh, you know what um, a, a very good friend and a mentor of mine, Professor Ted Zoller says that uh, ecosystems are made by deal makers. And the more deal makers you have in an ecosystem, the faster it matures. And that's actually the way you count the maturity of, uh, of, um, of an ecosystem. So Luxembourg needs probably 10 entrepreneurs who have made two or three successful exits. And then the ecosystem will start to tick because these people will, will make a much stronger foundation to the ecosystem. Currently we have a, we have few angels, but they are investing, you know, funding, but there's not much smart capital yet in the ecosystem. There is no, v, I mean, there are two VCs, but majority of their investments still are outside the country because we don't have such a promising strong deal flow yet, but it's changing. The university is evolving. The output in terms of the intellectual know-how of the university is changing. I mean, if I was to bet in the next five years, we will have a, a, a huge seed fund in Luxembourg. It's, uh, it's, it's bound to happen. There's just no, no two ways about it. And one of the important part of, the, of an, any innovative ecosystem is also the, the tech journalists or the startup journalists because they you know they, they talk about about the startups etc and, and yes you have many investors who who are very conservative because just because they don't know the startup exists and if they read in, in, their, in their journal that there is a great startup has emerged etc they you know they, they raise the desire to invest into these guys and what about the, 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 the journalists the, the journalist, uh, in, in Luxembourg? Are, are, they, are they hungry for, for, your, for the startup uh, in Luxembourg? Absolutely. I think, I think communicating for us the success stories or even just the, the stories of our, our uh, daring entrepreneurs has not been a challenge at all. Um, I think in, that's one thing I have to say, like, you know, um, the, the community of, of startup enthusiasts in Luxembourg, because it's such a small community, is very, very strong. 
uh, with within one with one email i could get uh, you know a, a promising young, young entrepreneur and uh, an inspiring story on paper jam it's just one email and that would be done uh, if you wanted to you know communicate uh, some success stories uh, it it's very easy to reach out to you know silicon luxembourg and uh, you know it's a startup in itself and and we you know we kind of uh, we we feel for each other because you know they, they have been there they're still there they're growing uh, so they're always enough people in the ecosystem always ready to lend a hand uh, to future you know entrepreneurs and support them almost kind of you know creating this market uh, pull that uh, you're not alone uh, we're here to help you and you know already kind of uh, celebrating even the smallest steps that these startups take and i think that's something in fact there has really played a huge role for the university incubator because uh, most most students when they come to the university and in, actually in the first courses that they take with us we ask them who is an entrepreneur for you can you name some and then the the typical names come you know bill gates uh, steve jobs and zuckerberg um and then we we try to tell them like what about these people and then they, this is a page full of uh, peers sometimes even uh, students from their own course one year before them uh, and then say do you know these people and let me tell you the story of these people these are equally brave and they are actually also um, you know entrepreneurs not yet successful but you never know you might be in future naming few of them and that's the process of changing you know the the mindset so what we tell them is like look i mean you could be there in 2 years time and it's not like okay they are not yet on financial times or new york times but they are in paper jam and they are in silicon luxembourg uh, and it's equivalent for luxembourg i think and they have made a mark on the ecosystem here in luxembourg and who knows some day they might uh, be also you know role models for you uh, and but uh, and what we tell them is that yes uh, keep role models uh, of the ones you can touch because they will uh, help you much more and this is what's happening so every event we do we try to make sure that at least few of our current entrepreneurs come back and and discuss because that just makes the whole concept of entrepreneurship so much more tangible because no none of them are going to go and ask you know zuckerberg you know how scared they were or what were the challenges that they faced and did they have the same kind of doubts that they are having right now but they can ask other entrepreneurs from the ecosystem and even their peers who are still students maybe one year ahead of them or two years ahead of them or just alumni who decided after studies to not take up a job and are running a company i mean successfully uh, growing it scaling it and and they can ask them all of these questions is it tough what's your life like are you getting support from the ecosystem uh, are you having second thoughts <laughs> would you do it again you know these are important questions that students ask themselves and if they, if we can get them those answers from from people who actually they they feel like we are looking into the mirror that's the best possible education that you can provide or inspiration you can provide the entrepreneurs so that's something we are very successful in doing and and we are very proud of of our entrepreneurs in the sense that not only that they are doing a great job for themselves but they are really helping us also with the future entrepreneurs because they whenever we tell them like hey we have an event there's going to be about 100 students there 50 students there can you come and talk to them can you share your knowledge with them they're always there they're always there to help out um now it's quite already getting to the point that some of our entrepreneurs are even coming back and doing courses with us so they are even offering trainings uh, in you know what where they talk, talk about the mistakes that they made and what they learned out of it which is actually even more valuable than anything else saying look guys we did that we did that we did that all of this did not work so please don't do that but what we found works is this so use that so i mean the simplest things like how do you slice a pie at the early stage of a startup is something you know most entrepreneurs still get it wrong i mean even experienced entrepreneurs get it wrong so expecting you know young students when they're starting the company the first time it's not natural that they all think okay we are all friends everybody gets equal share but uh, things change very quickly when a startup starts to become a actual company so like things like this uh, learning about how to do marketing which which places you can go for support um i mean simplest things like you know we tried 10 different accountants now this is the best one that we used so others were you know not providing the best service or they understand better the needs of the early stage startup things like this these are these are minor things but it it makes a huge difference 
for future entrepreneurs to be able to ask somebody this question, have somebody as a buddy who's going to hold them, hold their hands and help them. We are always there, but they realize that the community that they're entering is actually much bigger and they will not be alone. That, that in itself is, uh, you know, it's like walking in the dark in the night. Uh, if you have, if you're more people, you are confident. Uh, if you're going to do it alone, you're going to have second thoughts. Excellent, excellent. Um, and what about the, the professor, uh, the, 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 the teaching, the teacher and professor of the university today? Are, are they involved in, in, in helping the staffers, you know, by, for example, if a professor in law teach IP, uh, could you, could you uh, call him for, for personal consulting to, to start up with a particular problem on IT or, or management or whatever? We, we are getting there. We weren't there yet. I think we would have gotten there if COVID had not hit. Uh, but now with COVID, of course, with these restrictions, we had some challenges because all the professors had their own challenges. Sure. Because, uh, I mean, they might have so far prepared for doing lectures and sessions in person. But suddenly now they were forced to create the content uh, in a new way and teach in a new way. So throughout COVID, it kind of pushed us a bit back. But there are things that we are starting and initiating soon. So university has a law clinic where law students and professors give guidance to university ecosystem members. You can go for some you know, legal guidance and support. So we are now trying to partner with them. So soon that will be a facility available to our startups. So they could you know, go and ask questions regarding incorporation, like tax law in terms of how to structure the companies, um, NDAs, uh, or you know, how to set up uh, contracts and agreements with providers. All of these things, we will standardize that. And hopefully, you know, that's already going to be a huge, tremendous help to our startups. Um, we, we have been talking to different professors in terms of bringing them in also at different stages. Um, some of our professors are open to it. Some are, you know, slowly getting soft towards this to, to learn. Um, we, we are leveraging initially also a lot from the ecosystem. So we have a lot of our mentors. So I haven't yet talked about my mentoring program, but um, we built a, a sister program with MIT. Uh, so this is, we have a VMS venture mentoring service uh, built on the principles that MIT has started. And we provide the same support uh, to, here, to our startups here. And um, our mentors is uh, a tremendous community. It's a tight knit uh, network, which is always ready to help out. So currently our mentors are actually, three of them are lawyers and they're helping us, you know, put the structure and foundation for the law clinic or the legal clinic. Uh, our mentors are bringing in the whole, uh, so next month, for instance, we're doing a session on how to build the culture of a startup. So in this case, it's a, it's a very experienced mentor from uh, Amazon who's going to draw in the similarities between how Amazon built this culture of innovation and the whole concept of thinking backwards, which is Amazon in itself is, is uh, hundreds of startups merged together. And, yeah. uh, and this is what we want to see in our startups. We're bringing this kind of knowledge from our mentors. So we, we are trying to build the bridge between keeping uh, theoretical perspectives of academic you know, knowledge and know-how about entrepreneurship combined equally with best practices, which comes from the corporate side. And our mentors, for instance, recently we did a workshop on how to recruit. So one of our mentors, she works uh, as, a, as a recruiter. She's in HR um, in EIB. And she's seen a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of how to recruit the best people, how to recruit top talent, how to hire them fast, but also fire them fast. And what are the considerations as a startup that you need to have when you're building the team? And, and this is something uh, we leveraged. And it was a very interesting session. Always goes much longer than we think we planned because the discussion just goes on and on. But uh, we managed to also, so our mentors are like, no problem. We like the discussion will stay on. And when they need to go, they're like, okay, I see there are lots of questions. Let's do a second session. So there's going to be a second session about it as well. So I, I think in Luxembourg, what is good is that everybody knows everybody. The, the culture of paying it forward is kicking in. I think people are having fun now. Um, and, and there are enough people who are at, at the stage of their career when they want to give back. They want to give back. And we, ask, we continuously ask our mentors for feedback. What are you in, why, what, why do you join this program? What are you getting out of it? And, 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 and one of the common running answers that we get you know, most frequently is that the, the, these students are just so much, I mean, there's so much energy there there's so many great ideas and, and the mentors feel somehow privileged to be able to, you know, contribute there. 
and they they get so much more back uh, uh, in return for the time involvement that they give to the startups and and some of them adopt our entrepreneurs you can see them i mean they are more happier than us than uh, even sometimes the entrepreneurs are humble when they succeed in our mentors you can see they're almost dancing and jumping <laughs> with success i mean they they, they celebrate this success sure. um so this is this is i think it's we are, we're getting there around the university we are successfully creating this community of people who who, who see the value that we are bringing in the ecosystem and the role that we have to play and which was not being played before we have to play this role and it's it's something that the university cannot ignore it's something that the country cannot ignore we need these students and entrepreneurs from the university to come out use luxembourg as their base and and build companies out of here which will be the future of the economy the future of the society they will be the change makers and leaders of tomorrow it's it's a uh, it's bound to happen and if we train them well we are just going to help them fulfill their full potential uh, and take the society along with that fantastic thank you very much uh, dr shai it was a real pleasure to hear about uh, what you have uh, accomplished uh, uh, with your uh, with your incubator and the entrepreneurship program with siva uh, it's very very impressive and very important uh, it's not just uh, uh, it's very important because uh, startup is building the future of all of us Thank yes. you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me here. It was a pleasure being here and uh, yeah and uh, look forward to to collaborating uh, with you in the future also and uh, and yeah and uh, we'll be happy to have more of our startups featured in your pleasure. podcast so that more people can know about the things that are going on in the university. With pleasure. See you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.